Thank you, Lee, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to add my welcome to ABEAR's Outlook 2014. As the Minister said, it's our 44th Outlook conference since they started in 1971. We have a great lineup of participants at this year's conference. We have distinguished international speakers as well as domestic producers and others in the agriculture sector. I encourage you all to participate in the interesting discussions I'm sure we'll have over the next two days about the issues that matter to all of us. And of course, to enjoy some useful networking opportunities in the sidelines. And as Lee said, I'm going to stay with the theme of the conference this morning, and that's realising the opportunities. I want to speak about the very real opportunities for Australian agriculture coming from the rise in world food demand, especially in our own region. Then I want to raise three issues relating to productivity that we'll have to address if we want to take advantage of that opportunity. And these are the burden of government regulation in agriculture, the need to invest in infrastructure, and the role of research and development, all issues that the Minister mentioned uh, in his presentation. I know there are many more than those three issues, but I'm going to focus on just those three, because to a large extent, they're within the control of government and industry. Others, like the vagaries of the weather, we can plan for, but we can't really directly affect. But firstly, I'll run through our medium-term outlook for commodities. And there are always two main assumptions that underpin our forecasts, and the first of these is economic growth. So after several years of slowing economic growth, we're expecting to see the start of a recovery in 2014. We're forecasting global growth to reach 3.4%. And we expect that to pick up further in the next two years before moderating to around 3.6% by 2019. OECD countries will provide some support for this growth as public spending cuts are reduced and private demand gradually recovers. That will underpin expansion in emerging economies, where we expect to see export performance improve and private demand expand. Emerging economies will continue to contribute the most to world economic growth. China's a little more complex. China's new government announced reforms last year that are expected to slow economic growth in the very short term, and the need to reform the financial system remains a constraint. But stronger external demand from OECD countries will support growth over the medium term, and we're expecting China's growth to average around 7% a year to 2019. That's a good deal below the average over the past 10 or more years, but it's sufficient to play a strong role in driving global growth. We're going to hear more about uh, China from Dr Huang later in this session. Now, the next graph illustrates our assumption about the, Austra uh, the Australian exchange rate against the US dollar, and it's that exchange rate that drives the value of a lot of our commodity exports. There's been volatility in the exchange rate in the past year, and it's declined to an average of under 90 cents so far this year. We expect that depreciation to continue in the short term to an average of around 85 US cents in 2014-15 and to around 83 cents towards 2018-19. But even at 83 cents, it's high compared with its 30-year average of around 76 US cents. And in terms of the commodity outlook, we're forecasting that 2013-14 will be a strong year with total farm output up to almost $51 billion. If you're familiar with our recent crop report, you'll see that our estimates of crop production for this year are high because of close to record winter crops in Western Australia and South Australia. That remains the forecast, even though there have been severe drought impacts on winter and summer crops in Queensland and northern New South Wales. Livestock returns are also up in 2013-14 as export demand for meat and live animals strengthens. We're expecting a small reduction in the value of farm production in 2014-15 to 50.4 billion, and that reflects falls in both crop and livestock production as a result of the ongoing dry conditions. Export earnings are expected to follow the same pattern with a small reduction to $38.3 billion in 14-15 from the forecast highs of this financial year. But we expect the value of wheat and sugar exports to rise on the back of volume increases, 
and dairy products to benefit from increases in world prices. There'll be speakers in our commodity sessions later today who will you'll be expanding on those forecasts and looking out to the medium term. But I want to touch here very briefly on um, farm financial performance because I know that's an area of concern with drought conditions in parts of the country. This shows the national level and we're expecting farm cash income to rise to about $124,000 in 2013-14. That's more than 40% above the average for the past 10 years. But of course it's an average and there's significant variation between regions, commodities and enterprises. In Western Australia, broadacre incomes are forecast to be the highest recorded in more than 30 years because of near record winter grain production, and that story is similar in South Australia. In New South Wales, it's a mixed outcome with increases in income in the south because of higher grain production and higher prices for sheep and, and lambs. But in the north, we expect incomes to decline because of reductions in grain production and lower sale yard prices for cattle, due at least in part to the effects of the current drought. And in Queensland, we're projecting incomes for broadacre farms to average $39,000. That's the lowest recorded since our farm surveys began 37 years ago, and it's around half the average income of the past 10 years. In the productivity session this afternoon, Peter Gooday from ABEARS will be looking in more detail at the farm performance story. But I want to switch now to some medium term issues and principally the strong growth in world food demand and prices that we expect to see. And this is a graph we showed at Outlook last year and it comes from work we did to explore what might happen to world food demand over the period to 2050. It's based on some average assumptions about population and income growth, and it shows world food demand expanding by about 75% over that period and supporting higher food prices. And this year we've drilled down to look at the forecast demand in our own region. We know that most of that global growth will come from Asia and principally from developing economies. economies. And there's no doubt that China will play a central role in that. Jamie Penn from ABEARS is going to be looking in detail at China uh, in the next session in this theatre. But just as a headline, we expect China to account for almost half the global increase in food consumption over the period to 2050. And as incomes grow in China and the urban population expands, we expect to see changes in the pattern of food consumption. Since last year, we've been working to understand the types of changes that might happen. And this shows some of the trends we think we'll see in the value of food consumption on a per person basis. And that's a reduction in the value of traditional staple foods, vegetables, cereals, starches, and significant growth in meat, sugar, and dairy. Most of that growth in value will be from increases in the quantity demanded rather than because of price rises. This graph shows the picture in urban areas where incomes are higher but the same directions are already beginning to appear in some rural areas. And when you combine those per person trends across the country with population growth, that means significant increases in total demand from China for key food commodities. And while China and other Asian economies are likely to increase their food production, we don't see that being sufficient to meet the growth in consumption and imports will need to expand. We see that happening already. This shows China's apparently extraordinary growth in demand for beef in just the past seven or so years. From almost nothing, beef imports approached 300,000 tonnes in 2013. There was probably some, if not quite a lot, of unofficial grey trade in those early years, but it's still a significant rate of growth. So it's tempting to think that here in Australia we're well placed to take advantage of this boom, and there's a fair amount of commentary around about growing more, shipping it to China, and watching our own rural incomes grow. But if we really are to become the food bowl of Asia, we'll need to compete intensely with the world's gro largest growing meat, grains, and other food producers. And just two quick examples of that. Australia is currently the largest supplier of beef to China, but there's significant potential competition from other countries. 
The Chinese government has negotiated an MOU with India for imports of buffalo meat, but trade hasn't started yet, at least officially. The US and China have started discussions to restore access for US beef following the ban related to BSE. And Brazil's government continues to support beef production and exports through pasture and genetic improvement programs. In the case of grains, rapid expansion in exports from the Black Sea and Latin America are likely to increase competition for Australian product, particularly if there's further investment in transport and export infrastructure. Both those areas have much to gain from expanding trade to China. And so while we're not small players in these markets, the competition is real, and it isn't a foregone conclusion that Australia will always be the winner. One of the key things we'll need to do to make the most of opportunities in global food markets is to maintain and improve our competitiveness through continuous productivity improvements. ABARES has done a lot of work in productivity over the past few years, and many of you will be familiar, I think, with this general story that productivity growth in agriculture has slowed in the past decade and is now well below its long-run average. There's also a widening gap between the productivity of the best-performing farms and average farms. There are many reasons for that slowdown, not least of which has been drought. We're also seeing the consequences of slower growth in public funding for agricultural R&D, translating into slower uptake of new technologies and innovations. But a key factor in the productivity slowdown is that many of the big productivity-enhancing reforms have already been made. The boost to productivity that followed reforms such as dismantling price support schemes and reducing subsidies has largely run its course. More efforts to remove distortions and increase exposure to competition are unlikely to yield further significant productivity gains because there isn't much left to do. As the Minister mentioned, our farmers are already the second least supported in the OECD. Instead, future opportunities to improve agricultural productivity and enhance competitiveness in export markets will need to come from other sources. Some of the recent work we've been doing in ABARES with the OECD on productivity identifies a number of these, and these are the three challenges I mentioned earlier. The first is to reduce the burden of government regulation on the agriculture se sector. The second is to encourage investment in infrastructure that will support agricultural production and exports. And the third is to ensure that rural research and development efforts are efficient and targeted at improving innovation at the farm level. And I want to say something briefly about each of these. Regulation affects farm business operations at all stages of production and compli compliance burdens can add significantly to farm costs. It also affects the activities of businesses in upstream and downstream industries that have an effect on agriculture. Some, if not much, of this regulation is intended to achieve social and environmental objectives, which we've heard about, and it reflects community concerns about the impacts of farm production. Pressure to regulate is being driven increasingly by negative attitudes towards specific farm practices or technologies. Regulation around genetically modified crops, access to chemicals and animal welfare are just a few examples. This is an indicator from the World Economic Forum, and it suggests that the burden of regulation in the agriculture sector in Australia is increasing relative to some of our major competitors in export markets. Australia's ranking has slipped from third in 2009 to 20th in 2013, while Brazil, one of our competitors, has improved its ranking to 23 out of 148 countries. Regulation is an important tool for governments to achieve policy objectives, but we need to think carefully about the costs and benefits of regulation and how we might do it better. The current government focus on reducing regulatory burdens is a good, good opportunity to reflect on how we regulate. But if we're to make significant progress in agriculture, we'll need to have buy-in from the states as well. In the case of infrastructure, we know we need good transport, water, energy, telecoms to take advantage of the new export opportunities. Our infrastructure systems have to support a growing industry by moving food cost-effectively and efficiently to markets. Bottlenecks or unreliable service reduce the competitiveness of agriculture and add to farmers' costs. 
But the reality is that much of the infrastructure currently supporting agricultural supply chains is already under pressure. And that pressure will increase as Australia's production and exports expand and increase the demand for infrastructure services. Last November, ABES released a preliminary assessment of potential pressures on infrastructure in five major supply chains. Pressures on the road system were a common theme. For example, a substantial expansion of beef production and exports in northern Australia is likely to require not only investment in processing facilities, but also to maintain and upgrade the road net network to improve year-round access. In the case of dairy production, expansion in some regions is likely to require, to require additional investment in irrigation infrastructure, both on and off farm. And for higher value products, investment in the infrastructure around air freight is going to become more important as exports expand. There are broader issues also, including the way in which funding for roads is prioritised and how we incentivise private sector investment in agriculture. The infrastructure session this afternoon and the Northern Australia session tomorrow is going to look at the details around some of those issues. And the final concern I want to touch on is research and development, because ultimately, realising higher on-farm productivity growth will depend on farmers having access to new technologies. Our agricultural industries have benefited from past industry-focused public R&D efforts that delivered significant productivity gains. And our rural R&D system remains the envy of research providers overseas, particularly the role played by the rural research and development corporations. But we've seen slow growth in public funding for agricultural research since the late 1970s, and a fall in expenditure as a proportion of industry output. That's the research intensity line on the graph here. And given the importance of public investment in Australia, it's not surprising that this has been linked to slowing productivity growth. Given scarce resources and growing demands, a key objective must be to maximise the payoffs to public funds and to improve incentives for increased private investment. That will involve ensuring there is a path to market for new technologies. And here again, getting regulatory settings right will be important not only to minimise regulatory burdens, but to provide a level of oversight consistent with society's expectations. I've only just mentioned some of the issues that will drive productivity in agriculture and help us realise the opportunities for our export industries. While we're well placed to take advantage of growing international markets for food, we need to think and plan to achieve that potential. The issues I've touched on and many more will be on the table in our sessions over the next two days, culminating in the final session tomorrow that aims to bring together the many strands that will influence the long-term future of agriculture. So I hope you're able to participate in those discussions and to enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.